Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen InshaAllah we continue today Ba'da wa nashahadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu anna muhammad al abdu wa rasuluh We stopped last week discussing in the ways how the hadith is transmitted and how the hadith is taken. That was the last thing we discussed last week. The hamul hadith wa adaul hadith. Adaul hadith. How does the muhadith narrate the hadith? And the hamul hadith. How is hadith taken? And we say from the most important terminologies we have to know there is that there's three ways. There's three ways. And those three ways, they determine the strength of that narration according to some scholars. According to some scholars. The first being a sama. And the second is al qira and the third, al ijaz al samaa what is samaa is when directly hearing from the sheikh that is samaa linguistically it gives the meaning also samaa meaning listening okay so it's when someone directly hears the hadith from the sheikh whether the sheikh is doing it from memory or the sheikh is reading from his books. It doesn't matter. As long as it's the sheikh speaking, then that way of transmitting the hadith is called sama. And mostly, they use the word sabi'tu, I heard. They use the word sami'tu or haddathani, he Inform me, praise God, he told me. Or haddathana, if it's many. The second one is al qira And qira is when? It's when the student is the one who's reading the hadith and the sheikh is sitting there listening. If there's a correction, he just makes the correction. Otherwise, they read the whole book. And after that, the Shaykh says, okay, I give you permission now. You had this hadith from me. How do they express this? They use, Akhbarani, he informed me. Or Akhbarana, he informed us, in plural. Or sometimes they say, Qara'atu, alayhi, I read to him. But this is rare. Especially in the actual books of hadith. If you read the books of any books of hadith, whether it is Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn, any book, it is very strange to find in the Isnad someone saying, Haddathani Fulan, Qara'atu Alayhi. It appears very strange. Mostly is Haddathani, Akhbarana, An, Sami'tu, Qala. Those five are the most, most common. And the third way, the third way we say is what? Al Ijaza and Al Ijaza is when is when the Sheikh he just gives permission to whoever is narrating the hadith. He says, I give you permission to narrate this hadith from me. And it could be specific, I give you permission to narrate Sahih Muslim from me through my isnad. Or it could be Ijaza to Naam, general Ijaza. He'll say, I just took I have given you ijaza in all of my um, reports, all my isnad which I have. So if I have ijaza in Bukhari, in Muslim, Abu Dawood, um, maybe in books of fiqh, whatever, I've given you all of that. And this one these days, or mostly the scholars, they call it ijaza bil baraka. This is for baraka only. The scholar is like blessing you, hoping that Allah blesses you. But basically, you didn't sit with him or, or get knowledge from him, you know. It's so maybe just he visit, you visited him once, and he sees that, mashallah, you're a good uh, a student, you know. So he gives you that. He says he's okay to be given that. That's why we say this is the, the weakest. It could be the weakest. 
because like we said also one of the conditions Shah ibn Uthaymin he put is that he said the ijaza cannot be recognized unless unless we, co we, we affirm what that they met otherwise anybody can claim anything you can come to them and say I have an ijaza from uh, Sheikh al-Albani before he died he gave me an ijaza but you never met him well before this was a problem but today in today's world it's not because there's a telephone there's the internet where people can be given ijazah through the internet and like I told you um, there's many majalis al-sama' al-hadith sittings where the, the hadith is being read to the, to the sheikh and they say whoever cannot come personally he can participate online you just register your name and where you're from and you listen the student is reading Sahil Bukhari to the sheikh and you listen once it's finished the sheikh gives ijazah to everyone those who are there physically and those who are online because even though you are not there physically but you are there in the class you are listening and whatever the sheikh had to say you are there so it was like you are there so ijazah is recognizable even if you're not there personally if it is given for you uh, if it is given to you after we mentioned those three or those four ways of ada samitu and akhbar akhbarani or akhbarana and an and qala and we showed the example from Sahih al-Bukhari, the hadith we had last week. Well, al-Bukhari, he said in this hadith in his Sahih, al-Bukhari says, Haddathana Abdullah ibn Yusuf. Right? Is it clear for everyone? Is it big enough? big enough now huh yes okay all people can you see okay good you know there's nothing wrong with being old you know the problem with human beings when you're young you can't wait to be old Then when you grow old and responsibilities start coming on you, say, oh, I wish I can go back to be a child. And people take care of me and nobody <laughs> has to be taken care by me. Human beings, subhanAllah. There's nothing wrong with being old. Unless you take it as a, as a, as a, as a, in a bad way, you know. There's nothing wrong. Say, oh, you young people, say, you old people. If you don't consider yourself old, then there's nothing wrong. You know, you can say, I'm 65, but I'm young. It's good. It's good. Now, everybody can see. Alhamdulillah. Al Bukhari says, Haddathana Abdullah bin Yusuf. So we'll highlight that one with a yellow highlight. So Haddathana means what? What does Haddathana mean? It means here, Bukhari took this hadith from. Abdullah bin Yusuf meaning Abdullah bin Yusuf was narrating the hadith and Bukhari was there and he was part of a group because it says Haddathana Haddathana is us, it's a group not Haddathani so Bukhari had this hadith from Abdullah bin Yusuf who was one of the sheikhs of Bukhari it takes from him a lot of hadith how many sheikhs did Bukhari have? yes a lot a lot Abdullah bin Yusuf he says Akhbarana Malik Abdullah bin Yusuf we put that highlight in green he says Akhbarana Malik what does that mean 
¿Ah? No. Yes. It doesn't mean that he read the hadith. Akhbarana. Akhbarana means us. So he was part of the group where someone, it could be him, was reading to Malik and Malik permitted them to take this hadith. And like we said, and we discuss Imam Malik today, inshallah, Imam Malik never read to anyone. He never read to anyone. They would read to him. Then he gives you permission. Okay, it's like you took this hadith from me. So he says, Abdullah bin Yusuf says, Akhbarana Malik. Malik, it was read to him this hadith, and we took this hadith from him. Malik says, An Ibn Shihab, from Ibn Shihab. And Ibn Shihab, he says, An Anas bin Malik. These are the most common ways you'll see in the books of hadith. The other one you'll find which you don't have here is Sami'tu, I heard. Sami'tu, I heard. And Sami'tu, it is on the same level like what? Like Haddathan, it means you heard directly from the Sheikh. Okay? Or they would say Qala. If they say Qala, Qala means what? He said. If they say Qala, or if you see An, you have An there, you have to check. Like we said last week, if it is one of those narrators who are known for Tadlis, and we went through Tadlis, you can find that in your book, you go read about Tadlis. If it's one of the narrators known to do Tadlis, then if they say An, or Qala, you have to check properly very careful did they actually hear the hadith or they're just doing tadlis but if they say samit or akhbarana then this is okay and to the end of the hadith so this is the way this is the way these are the siyakul ada'ul hadith the ways where hadith is transmitted the ways the hadith is transmitted Now moving on, we go to the next one today, which is on page, um, what page number is that? Huh? 41. Who doesn't have a book? You don't have a book. Okay. But you have to come every week. Now? As long as you come every week. Okay. Now those are the ways of transmitting hadith. It could be you are listening and then you write, or it could be you're just memorizing. You could be like Imam Ahmad, you memorized 600,000 hadith, so one hadith for you is no problem. You could be like Bukhari, you memorized 300,000 hadith, so it's not a problem. You know, you don't have to write. But you could be like me and you, you're listening, then you have to write us. Because you fear five minutes later, <laughs> it, goes, it goes back with the Sheikh. The Sheikh he left and he left with his hadith. Um, so, Kitabatul Hadith, or Kitabul Hadith, the writing down of the hadith. And this is now how we're going to come into the books, the books of hadith. He says, definition. This is the narrating of narrations by means of writing them down either in books and books is today. They didn't have books. They did not have books. Books in the meaning which we have today, printed, binded books. They didn't have that. They had manuscripts, of course. They used to write on parchments, on leather, on old-fashioned paper, all of that. Or letters, basically. 
the ruling in its asl the origin the writing down of hadith is mubah it is allowable it's okay because this is one of the methods of narrating and preservation the evidence from the sunnah um, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said the message of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam allowed abdullah ibn amr ibn as to write down what he heard from him this hadith is a beginning to it abdullah ibn amr he used to write every time the prophet sallam speaks he would write so some of the sahaba they came to him and said to him what is wrong with you you write everything you write everything don't write don't write so he went to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said ya rasulullah i write everything you say but some of the sahaba are older than me they said i should not write the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said what he said uktub write for wallahi because wallahi ma yakhruj ma yakhruj minhu illa alhaq nothing comes from this mouth except the truth right so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave permission for abdullah ibn amr to write and if you remember last week we said abu huraira is the one who memorized the most hadith or narrated the most hadith afa not memorized narrated the most hadith but he said what there's no one who had more hadith than me except Abdullah ibn Amr why because Abdullah ibn Amr used to write and I did not use to write so during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they used to write hadith Abdullah was one of them they used to write so this is something very important as a as a reply to those people who bring doubts they bring doubts to the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam those people want to reject the sunnah and to discard the books of hadith they say these these are written by men and they were written 200 years after the prophet completely wrong completely wrong the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was written when he was alive he was alive and some of the sahaba were writing some of the sahaba were writing and this is one of the hadith okay somehow he doesn't want to scroll down what was turned off i didn't press anything press what mashallah you should come every week huh? don't miss it's not working the fn and f5 is not working F5 alone. Let's refresh. I never wanted Google though. It's not scrolling. It's true. The thing is not scrolling. I have a mouse. Jazakallah khair. all of these computers we make them and then one time they they overcome us huh you want bring make these things then they huh i have i have one i didn't notice it jazakumullah khair ah he says however if there's a reason to be afraid of writing down hadith then it this instance it becomes haram and this is one of the doubts people mention there's an authentic hadith in sahih muslim this hadith here the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says do not write down anything from me except the quran and whoever has written down anything other than the quran from me he should erase it although after mentioning all of this if preserving the sunnah or calling to it can only be achieved by writing then it becomes wajib to write them down how do the scholars reply or explain this hadith and this is the only hadith which is authentic by the way about not writing hadith this is the only one ah number 1 this was in the beginning this was in the beginning the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he feared that people ought to write down the hadith and they ought to write down the quran together it will be mixed up on them and they'll be confused 
They will take the hadith to be Quran and the Quran to be hadith made. Second thing, remembering also that the Quran was still coming down. So if you wrote the Quran and you wrote the hadith, where are you going to put the next verse which is coming? It might create confusion. It might create confusion. So in the beginning, the Prophet وسلم, he said this, do not write. And also, another uh, explanation is that he said this to only general people. Don't write down, except the Quran. But specific people whom he trusts, it was okay for them to write. Because he knows these people, they will not mix up or confuse things. Like Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As and others, who he knew they used to write. So this was in the beginning, because there was fear of confusion. And it was for general people not everyone should write plus you know the arabs most of them most of them did not write also it does not mean that none of them used to write no there was a good number of them who could read and write but the majority could not read or write so these are some of the explanations to this hadith and proofs other proofs which show the prophet sallallahu gave permission for people to write they show that this was in the beginning, when there was fear of confusion. Another evidence from the Sunnah, narrated Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave a khutbah on the day of the Fath al-Makkah. On the day of Fath al-Makkah. If I remember, it's not Fath al-Makkah. This khutbah was in the Hijjat al-Wada'a, in the last Hajj, if I remember. And there was a man from the people of Yemen called Abu Shah. The Prophet Sami spoke a lot in that khutbah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Uktubli, whatever you have said, write it down for me. Coming all the way from Yemen. So the Prophet Sallallahu he said, Uktubli Abu Shah, or Uktubli Abu Shah, write down for Abu Shah. Why did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that? Why did he say, write for Abu Shah? Because he himself, he does not write. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And secondly, though it shows you that the Sunnah was written during his time with his knowledge and his permission. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other proofs. Other proofs. He says, it is also known from the seerah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to order his companions to write down his narrations, his words, his hadith. And send them with various messages to other kings, to kings uh, and noble people and general people, inviting them to embrace Islam. This is something known. And some of these letters are still preserved today, right? The Prophet Sam used to write to the king of, um, uh, the, of the Romans, the Persians, the, the king of Bahrain, the king of Abyssinia, all of those people. He wrote for them these letters, which some of them are still preserved, which shows you, it's another proof that the Sunnah was written. That is part of the Sunnah. What is Sunnah? What is the Sunnah? Let's see who remembers the first class. Statements or actions of the Prophet Wasallam. Weren't these letters statements and actions of the Prophet Wasallam? Of course. So it shows you the Sunnah, the point I'm trying to emphasize here. The Sunnah was written during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So whoever comes and says, oh, we cannot take Bukhari. Bukhari came 200 years after the Prophet and wrote this hadith. 200 years is a long time. No. Abdullah ibn Amr al-As and Muawiyah and Zaid and the rest, they used to write. They used to write. So this is the proof that writing of hadith is part of Islam and part of the sunnah of the Prophet now characteristics the Sheikh says characteristics special care it's working now special care and attention should be given when writing down a hadith because this is one of the ways of narrating and protecting the sunnah there are two rulings regarding the characteristic of writing down a hadith Number one, it could be wajib, it could be obligatory to write down the hadith. When is this? He says, it is an obligation to write the hadith in a clear and legible manner 
that prevents one from misinterpreting it. When you write down that hadith, it has to be written in a clear and legible manner which will prevent you from misinterpreting the hadith. Secondly, mustahab recommendation. It is recommended for the muhaddith, the scholar of hadith, to follow certain guidelines when writing down a hadith. Some of them are, number A, when, uh, uh, whenever he writes down the name Allah, it is recommended to write after it the words Ta'ala. Ta'ala means exalted. Or Azza wa Jal, the mighty and majestic. Or Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, the one who is free from all imperfections, the one who is exalted. And any other words which show the highness and praiseworthiness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These words should not, should not be abbreviated. But rather written in full. This recommendation also applies whenever writing the title. That is prophet or messenger or slave of Allah. Name or the kunya meaning Muhammad or Abul Qasim. Of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, whether you're writing the name of the Prophet himself, Muhammad, or you're writing his kunya, Abu Qasim, or you're writing his title, Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah, or Nabi, the Prophet, whatever you're writing, this rule also applies. It is preferable to write the salat and the salam after it. Yani sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or alayhi wasallam. This recommendation also includes the rest of the prophets of Allah alayhim salam and this is from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in sahih al-bukhari the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says when you mention any of the prophets fasallim alayhim you have to say the salam on them any prophet any prophet you have to say alayhi salam al-iraqi and al-iraqi is one of the main scholars of hadith Al-Iraqi says, it is disliked to abbreviate the salutations upon the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam with one or two letters. This is something we need to emphasize today. The Prophet in bracket S-A-W. It's not allowed. The Muhaddithun used to be tough on this. In Arabic they write Swad, the letter Swad. Because sallallahu alayhi wasallam starts with Swad. So just write Swad in, in brackets. You don't do that. If you cannot write the dua for your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then there's a problem for you. Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. A A W W. I used to be confused. I said maybe the auto text is working something wrong again. What is A A A W? And you say Assalamu Alaikum to someone W W R B. You know, there's no vowels, doesn't make sense, not a language. Then you get, oh, it's wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. A new one, a new one. Jazakallah khair. Jack. It's not allowed. It is not right. It doesn't matter who writes it. Don't say, oh, Sheikh so and so he writes it. It doesn't matter. It's not allowed. Al-Iraqi, he died in the year 806. That's almost 600 years uh, from today. They used to say this. Some of the manners of writing hadith, you don't write Swad or S-A-W, P-B-U-H, peace be upon him. No. Just write Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alayhi Salam. It is also recommended to do this act with the names or the kunya of the companions, the Sahaba. By adding the words, Radiallahu Anhu or Radiallahu Anha, if it is female. Radiallahu anhu, male. Radiallahu anha, female. After it. One should not particularize any one of them with a particular supplication or praise. Which is done whenever this particular companion's name is mentioned. Example, the case of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Radiallahu anhu, whom the Shia always add after his names. Karramallahu wajha. May Allah make his face noble. You cannot make one. If you say it once, it's okay. But if you say that and specify that for him, then it's wrong. 
عرف علی دیسے علیہ السلام they don't say رضی اللہ عنہ they say علیہ السلام just like other prophets because to them he's like a prophet in fact he's better than the prophets and you find sadly some of the اہل السنہ they take that from the شیعہ he says ابن کثیر رحمہ اللہ he said this is from the opening of the door which leads to over praising people the two shiyukh the two sheikhs Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman رضی اللہ عنہم عنہم is for a group two three million عنہم he says Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman they are more deserving of receiving this praise than Ali ibn Abi Talib because that is part of our aqeedah Abu Bakr is the best followed by Umar followed by Uthman and then Ali in terms of excellence that is the order Ahl Sunnah have agreed on anybody who confuses that or brings one above the other he is not part of Ahl Sunnah or he is not part of Ahl Sunnah in that um, a, a, a field specifically in terms of Khilafah Abu Bakr Umar then some of them said Uthman some of them said Ali right or wrong I want those who are with us in the class for Aqeedah to answer me huh? Muhammad Uthman and then Ali there's no difference it's the opposite I confused you see it's the opposite in terms of excellence who's better in excellence in excellence Abu Bakr and then Umar then some of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah also said Ali is better than Uthman some said no most in fact most said Uthman is better than Ali and the Ummah agreed on that mostly until today Abu Bakr then Umar and Uthman and Ali in terms of excellence but whoever says Ali is better than Uthman in terms of excellence there's nothing wrong we don't take him to be out of Ahl Sunnah but in terms of Khilafah leadership it is Abu Bakr and then Umar and then Uthman and then Ali there's no doubt there's no debate about that whoever says Ali should have deserved it more than Uthman then he's saying that the Muhajirun and the Ansar they were all wrong those who agreed in fact Ali himself was great to give the bay'ah to Uthman he's saying that Ali was wrong in terms of Khilafah there's no different there's no different is it clear B he says now oh sorry before that finally it is preferable to write after the name or the kunya of the successors the successors are the tabi'in those who came after the Sahaba in English they call them successors those after the successors and the past scholars were known to be noble and respected with words such as Rahimahullah or Rahimahumullah anybody who came after the Sahaba we put usually Rahimahullah Rahimahullah may Allah have mercy on him what about someone who's still alive as I mentioned uh, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Abbad what do I say can I say Rahimahullah yes you say no why no why yes ayya ahsant rahm of Allah is for the dead and for those who are alive some people they think when you say rahm this happened this happened one time you know one of the brothers the mention of the sheikh was still alive and they said rahm of Allah and this other brother he jumped like Audhu billah, he's not dead, he's not dead. He said, Akhi, the mercy of Allah is for those who are alive and those who are dead, it's okay. You say, Rahimahullah, it's fine. Huh? When you sneeze, exactly, and you say, Alhamdulillah, people say to you, Alhamdulillah. So, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Even though normally it's become like a custom, those who are alive, they say what? Hafizahullah, may Allah preserve it. Lakin, there's no problem. There's no problem even if you say what? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes. Yes. 
or is this salah only for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Huh? Where? Where do you get that? Where in the Quran? Can tell me it's in the Quran. Ah, huwa alladhi yusalli alaykum wa malaikatahu li ukhrijakum min al-dhulumat la nur. Allah mentioned about himself. He says the salat on you. He raises your praise and gives you his mercy. And his angels also say it on you. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says what himself? Man salli alayya wahidan sallallahu alayhi ashra. In the Quran also give me another clear proof or in the sunnah. Surah Tawbah. خُذْ مِنَ مُوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِّرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنُ اللَّهُمْ Allah says خُذْ مِنَ مُوَالِهِمْ O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Take from their wealth صَدَقَةً meaning zakah the zakah which is a must to give it is going to purify them and purify their wealth and then وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should say salah on them, the Muslims, so you take the zakah from them. Inna salataka sakanun law, because your salah will be a source of peace on them. What does the salah mean? It means dua. Salah linguistically means dua. It means dua. And from Allah, it means may Allah give you his mercy, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise your status, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praise you. Athana. Yes, that's what it means. So when you say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala alim, we say, oh Allah, praise or increase the praise of our Prophet and have more mass on him and raise his status. That's what it means. That's why when you say it once to the Prophet sallam, Allah says it for Allah gives it for you ten times. Okay? So it is okay if once in a while, once you are to say that, but to make it a custom, no. It is customary used for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because it is a must when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned to, this, to, say, to say the Salah on him. It's a must. It's a must. Other people, if you read once or twice, it's okay. Eh? It's not a sin. My point is not a sin. B, he says, from the manners of writing hadith, the muhadith should indicate the matin of the hadith, the text. Uh, with distinguishing features or traits to make it differ from the rest of the hadith. Example, placing quotation marks. Because if you're going to write the chain also, so how are you going to separate the chain or the words of the interpreter? Sometimes they have to explain the hadith. How are you going to distinguish that from the actual matin? You put it in quotations or in brackets. Or sometimes they'll write with a different color. At the beginning and the end of the hadith, writing the text of the hadith may be in bold or distinguishing letters. This is done in order to differentiate the words of the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the rest of the narration and thus not to confuse anyone reading the hadith. Because sometimes the words of other narrators can be mixed with the hadith. Then this hadith becomes what? Mm. This hadith becomes what? What kind of hadith does it become? When the words of the narrators, they are mixed with the hadith, the words of the Prophet ﷺ. Huh? No, it's not, it's not da'if. What is the terminology for that? I'm not continuing this class until you answer that question. Yes. Huh? No, it's not at least. You have to review, I said, you have to revise. Knowledge is by revision. No, ayo. It's idraj. It becomes hadith mudraj. Hadith mudraj. The hadith mudraj is when words of one of the narrators are mixed with the words of the Prophet. Sallallahu Remember the hadith of Abu Huraira? What did he say? Ah, he said, Asbihul wudu, wailun lil'aqabi min al-nar. Do wudu properly. 
war to the hills from the hellfire. The first part, do wudu properly. Are they words of the Prophet or Abu Hurairah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's words of the Abu Hurairah. The second part as well is words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. War to the hills from the hellfire, those who don't put water properly on their hills. That hadith is mudraj. So if you don't distinguish in writing which are the words of Abu Hurairah, which are the words of the Prophet Sallallahu then idraj could happen very easily. Especially before, you have to know, paper was something very valuable. To have paper you can write. Ink was something valuable. So, they would maximize their paper. So the hadith would be written there, on the, no on the side, they would write the explanation maybe. Or, you can have two books in one. You have the book, which they write, and on the side, on the margins, is completely another book. Yes. Completely another book. So if this gets mixed because you did not distinguish the words of the Prophet, ﷺ, then it becomes problematic. See, he says, it is recommended that the muhaddith follows the stipulated guidelines used when correcting mistakes. So whenever a word is lost, then he should add it either at the side or on top or below the text, indicating the word's exact place in the text. As for an extra word which needs to be removed, it should be crossed out with a single clear line. Thus making it clear to whoever reads the narration, knows that that word has been crossed out. It's not there. It doesn't belong there. In a case where the words are too many to cross out with a single line, the muhaddith should indicate or highlight with a word or symbol the start of the mistake and another to show the end of it. Basic writing rules which everyone should know. The word or symbol used should be distinct from the whole text of the hadith and anyone reading it should be, should be able to identify and know what it means. In a case where a word has been repeated twice, then the second repeated word should be crossed out. Except in a case where the second word is connected to another word after it. Example, Abdul, Abdul Hakim. The word Abdul is repeated. Which one should you cross out here? Which one? Yes, of course, Abdul. Which Abdul? The first or the second one? Which one do you cross out? The first. Because it's a name, Abdul Hakim. If you cross out the second one, then between Abdul and Hakim is another word which is crossed. So you cross out the first one and leave the name. D, he says, the muhaddith should not separate two phrases which are related to each other by turning each phrase into a sentence of its own, thus presenting a false interpretation. Example, the narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he said, Bashir qatil ibn Safiyyat ibn Nar, give glad tidings to the killer of ibn Safiyyah, that is Zubair ibn Awam, he is going in the hellfire. Thus, a muhaddith, this is one hadith, the person who killed Zubair ibn Awam, he came, he came happily bragging to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali he cried and he said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, give news to the one who will kill the son of Sophia. Sophia is the aunt of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Zubair was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Ali. He said, give, give him news, the one who killed Zubair, that he's going to the hellfire. So this is one hadith, you don't separate two phrases, such that it seems like they are two separate sentences. So he says, that's a muhaddith, should not separate the two phrases, should not, you're missing the word not there, making each one into a sentence of its own. Thus, a muhaddith should not separate the two phrases, making each one into a sentence of its own, so it will become, give clear tidings to the killer. Ibn Safiya in the hellfire. No. E. The muhaddith is recommended to use. The word use is, is not there. To use. The symbols which are known amongst the scholars of narrations. Example. Now this is, this is a, a place where they should have used the Arabic. You know, 
for example now what is now he says example na and thana and dathana are used as abbreviations for the word haddathana for the word haddathana so We show the example here, Haddathana. We have Haddathana right there. Al-Bukhari says, Haddathana Abdullah bin Yusuf. If you look at the screen, if you look at the screen, you'll see it. Now, that is how it's written, Haddathana. But sometimes, because you have a lot of hadith to write, and you want, like we said, paper was something valuable, you want to save space, they would abbreviate that. So, they would just write, So just write that. It just become na. If you see this na, noon and alif, it means haddathana. If you see that in the books of hadith, in an isnad, it means haddathana. Okay? Or sometimes they would put the dal, they will only take away the ha. It will be dathana. It means haddathana. It means Haddathana. Tayyip? And sometimes they have the word also Na and Arana and Amba on in uh, and Abna for the word Akhbarana. For the word Akhbarana. We have Akhbarana right there. The second one. The one in green. That is how it's written, Akhbarana, the one in green. So they would abbreviate it by taking away that also. It becomes Na also, sometimes. Especially for those scholars who don't differentiate between Akhbarana and Haddathana, for them it's the same. Or sometimes, they will take away the Alif and the Kha, like that. So basically, Sheikh Ibn Uthameen is saying, Whatever abbreviations you're going to use, make sure they are the abbreviations the scholars use. Don't bring your own. You're using things which nobody knows. Or sometimes he says, instead of writing qala, they'll write just like the qaf. Just the qaf in qala. And also, he says, the Arabic letter ha, the Arabic letter ha, is used what time is maghrib the arabic letter ha is used as a symbol to inform us that the muhaddith has stopped at one is at one sanad and is moving into another sanad this is usually done if there are more than one isnad for a hadith the insertion of this letter can occur at the beginning or the middle or at the end of the Sanad. Furthermore, this letter must be pronounced as it was written. The letter Ha, and he gave you examples. Again, whoever translated that book, you should have given you the exact Arabic example so you can know. We have the examples there. See, this is Thana and Ana and those examples there. Or they put the qaf instead of qala. They just write the qaf. Now this is the example for the ha. Let me show you the example for the ha. You can see. You can see. You're not old. Okay, okay. I thought you were saying you're old. Okay, he says Mithalu, example. Qawlul Bukhari, Bukhari says, this again is an isnad in his book. This is from the book of Sahih al-Bukhari. Okay, an actual example. He says what? He uses the word, Haddathana Abu Ma'mar. Haddathana Abdul Warith. Qala Yazid. 
حدثني مترف ابن عبد الله عن عمران قال قلت يا رسول الله فيما يعمل العاملون قال كل ميسر لما خلق له he says that is the wrong example sorry sorry this is the example that is just one isnad Bukhari he says Bukhari he says حدثنا يعقوب بن إبراهيم okay يعقوب بن إبراهيم informed us قال حدثنا ابن علي عن عبد العزيز بن سهيب عن أنس عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم and then you have what you have ha okay he brought the whole isnad to Anas and Anas from the Prophet Sallallahu instead of bringing you the hadith now he tells you no wait I have another isnad for this hadith same hadith ha is a change from one isnad to another isnad so he says to you ha wa haddathana and also wa again wa means in Arabic means what and wa haddathana and also Adam informed us قال حدثنا شعب عن قتاد عن أنس قال قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم then you bring the hadith so you have one hadith how many isnads two isnads the letter ha is to change from one isnad to the to the other one so this change was when though? was it at the beginning of the isnad or the end of the isnad or the middle it was at the end he brought the whole isnad he brought the isnad to Anas and Anas to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم look again Go with me. Al-Bukhari says at the beginning here. Hadathana Yaqub ibn Ibrahim. Right? Hadathana ibn Uliya. An Abdul Aziz bin Suhaib. An Anas. An in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's when the hadith comes, right? You have reached the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Instead of bringing the hadith, the isnad is ended now, right? He changes now. He brings ha. No, let me take you to another isnad. So this change is at the end. Then he brings the other isnad in full to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam again. Hadathana Adam, Hadathana Shu'ba and Qatada and Anas. Qala qala al-Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then he brings the hadith. So the tahwil or the tahawul is at the end here. Now he gives us another example where the change is in the middle of the isnad. He says, Qawlu Muslim, Imam Muslim, he narrates this hadith. Muslim says, Haddathana Qutayba ibn Sa'id. Qala Haddathana Layth. Then you have your Hadi. So Muslim just mentioned two people. Muslim mentioned who? Qutayba bin Sa'id and Layth. Then he changes the Isnad. He says, Wahaddathana Muhammad bin Rumh. Haddathana Layth. It's the same Layth who's the second person. You see that? The first is not Muslim says. Muslim says, listen to me. He says, Qutayba bin Sa'id gave us this hadith. And he took it from Layth. Then he changes the Isnad. He says, and also, Muhammad bin Rumh, he gave us this hadith. And he also took it from Layth. And then from there, it is one Isnad. So it is one isnad from the top. We went through this in the hadith gharib, if you remember. Sometimes it's only one person narrating from the Prophet, then one person from the Sahaba, then there's a million. This is the example. So instead of Muslim writing for you, Haddathana Qutayah bin Sa'id and Layth, then to a whole isnad, then changing it at the beginning, he just puts ha. So the ha, it means I'm just changing the isnad to the same person who was there. Is it clear? Okay, so we go for Salatul Maghrib and then come back, insha'Allah. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, shadu Allah ilayhi la anta astaghfiruka tu bilayk.